We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, go ahead and get the uh, camera on for the web tonight. But uh, again, I want to welcome you that are here tonight and those that will be watching my web also. Uh, sad point before we start our music tonight, uh, Ronnie Jones had passed away, so we certainly want to remember that family. So I talked with Brenda probably about a half hour ago, so we certainly want to keep them in prayer. And there's others that have had loved ones to pass away too. So, But anyway, right now we're going to start with singing, and Steve's going to go with that. I'll let him loose on that. All right, let's turn to page 832. The song we sing up on the square.
I want to mention also Kenny Corden. I talked to him there earlier too. He is back home now. Uh, she said they did get the fluid off of him, whatever was causing that. Uh, they still don't know for sure what was caused, causing that, but uh, we certainly want to continue to pray for him. Also, my wife, she was having, she thought like a migraine headache tonight, so I want to be in prayer for her. And like I said, Ronnie Jones had passed away, and there's some others that have passed away also. We want to remember all these families and uh, certainly keep them in our prayers. And uh, again, also announce uh, Steve Hester will be having his singing this Saturday, and that'll be up at the Unity Missionary Baptist Church. On and I said Third Street is actually three and uh, Church, Church, Church Street. So I get across from Fifth on this side, but on the other side. But that'll be this Saturday at 10 a.m. Also, he's got the okay for April to start doing the singings up there on the square. So hopefully that'll be better weather and we can all start coming up there. You that will uh, bring your chairs if you can. And uh, I think Steve throws a couple out there for you if you need them. But uh, anyway, that'll be starting up hopefully in April, weather permitting. And uh, that'll be every Saturday at that time at 10 a.m. So come out and be with us or be with them on that. Uh, hopefully we can start up our singings again here before long. We'll see how this month goes and uh, decide at the end of the month with that. So. Anyway, right now, uh, Bill Riley, I think, he says he's got the special tonight. Give Bill a hand as he does the special for us tonight. <laughs> All right, this song is called The Evening Prayer. If I ever did Somewhere so today, if I have caused one foot to go astray, if I have walked in my own way, away, dear Lord.
We're going to have prayer to end, but uh, before we get into God's Word tonight, has anybody got a testimony, something good God's doing for you? God working on anybody here tonight? Rick? I went to Dr. Day and got another shot. Thank you, we're good. COVID? No. Uh, cortisone. Oh, okay. So you're ready to lift the side of the tractor up now? Two <laughs> <laughs> days. <laughs> Give a hand. Doris? I've been cleared by two doctors to get my shoulder operated on the 30th of this month. Oh, I'll give you a date on it now. I think it's going to be around the 30th of this month. Okay. All right. Give the Lord a hand for that also. I just don't want to get that done. He's praying for others that are wanting to have things done too. So. Preacher, after we heard that, we went ahead and went to Point Castle. The big WH, huh? <laughs> or the w, big WC, that's what it is. Also, I forgot to mention also earlier, Lisa Zybert, uh, Chuck and Lisa. Am I pronouncing their, right, their last name right, Steve? Zybert? Okay. But her, she's got a son, Mark Nolan, and I think he's had like a light mini stroke or something like that. And they've asked us to keep him in prayer also. So we certainly want to do that. I think he was getting out of the hospital either yesterday or this morning. But uh, certainly want to lift him up in prayer and pray for their family. Chuck and Lisa, I think, said they were getting ready to get their last shot here soon. And they said, expect us to be busting the door down soon. So <laughs> we'll be looking forward to them getting back in there. Especially when we get our singings back started. Hopefully get enough people want to come and do those. We'll do it. But uh, anyway... Again, anybody else tonight something good? Charlotte? How's your leg doing, Paul? Doing very well. I thank you for reminding me of that. Actually, I don't remember it until I try to bend down too far. As long as I don't bend down far, it don't bother me. But thank God that uh, those first day or two, I, I couldn't hardly walk. But uh, God's good. Actually, what I was doing is walking down the steps, and I forgot that there was two more steps. <laughs> and my little dog was in front of me, and it was either... If I landed on a dog, it wouldn't have been good. So <laughs> I went down on my knees. So uh, anyway, the dog's doing good, but the knee didn't take it quite as good. But uh, thank you for asking. But thank God for that. Give the Lord a hand for that. It's doing good. And thank you all for praying for me for that and praying for me, period. I appreciate that. Anybody else tonight? Something good the Lord's did for you you want to share? Okay. Well, it's good to see you all that are normally not here on Wednesday night, out here tonight, and uh, hopefully one of these days we can get all of our ministries going back again. I'm talking about the youth and all the things, and the, the men's meetings and women's meetings, and the nursing home visitators, the ones that were doing the visits and stuff. I know that they love to do that, so uh, hopefully we're getting closer to the end of the COVID, the beginning of ministry in a specialer way. And we are praying for revival to see something good come out of all that. So, well, I'm going to ask you tonight if you would get your Bible and turn with me over to first, uh, 2 Corinthians once again. And like I say, we'll have prayer at the end of the service here tonight. means we're not doing communion this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Lord, we just ask you tonight to bless and anoint your word into our hearts. Help us to hear what it has to say. Help me to get out of the way and pray that you'll have yours. Uh, bless and anoint every heart here and every heart that will be listened by web. And just speak your blessings over all in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, We then, as workers together with him, him being Jesus Christ God, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain, emptily, worthlessly or valuably, valuelessly, but we receive it with, again, expectation for what God did for us. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. I think most of us has heard these next parts of this second half. We don't always remember where it's at, but it says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. You've heard me and you've heard other pastors and ministers, Brother Cash for years, uh, standing upon that verse that today is the day of salvation. You don't want to put it off. 
And again, that's what Paul is pointing out to these Corinthians here. He said, uh, giving no offense in anything, he's still, again, uh, standing up for their ministry, letting them know that, well, as we read here, it says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, and patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses and stripes and imprisonment and entombments and labors and watching, fasting, pureness, knowledge, and I'm just going to read through it, long suffering, kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfinished, our genuine love that is, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live as chastened and not, and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing, possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightening us, but ye are straightening your own bowels or in your own emotions. For now, for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. What's it say? Be ye also enlarged. Again, Paul is defending his ministry. And what he's saying there is we're not in this for the wrong reasons. We're not trying to take money. We're not trying to get prestige. We're not trying to be some kind of big showboat or anything else. And we know that a lot of that stuff's out there today, and I'm sure it was at that day and age too. But he's trying to let them know our ministry is not about me, myself, and I. Our ministry is about touching other people's lives. We go through, and again, the apostles, he's talked about the things that they went through, imprisonments, all the different things. All the stuff that they uh, was beaten and other things. Paul talked about himself and other places. But he did those things not because he wanted to be a big shot. Matter of fact, I, I kind of understand what Paul was feeling. If Paul could have disappeared and spoke without being seen, I'm sure he would have did it. I would like to be that sometimes. You know, when I'm up here preaching, and, and again, whether we've got a big crowd or a little crowd, I like to just disappear. Not because I'm afraid, but I just like to not be seen because it's not about me or anybody else. And I'm thinking most people that are in it for the wrong reason, the right reasons, I should say, they feel that way because I don't want you to see me. I want you to hear God. And I don't want you to hear me speaking God's Word. I want God's Word to be spoken to your heart. You know, if... You can talk to somebody till you're blue in the face, but when God begins to touch people's lives, when God begins to use what we're doing or somebody else is doing, the Psalms or whatever people are doing, when God begins to speak to people, that's when people's hearts change. You know, we don't want to just see people stay the change stay the same, forgive me for my country slang tonight, but we don't want to see people stay the same. We want to see people be moved by the Spirit, including ourselves. We want to see God do things in people's lives. And again, Paul was standing upon himself, letting him know, letting people know that it's not about anything of myself or these other people that are ministering. But I want you to look at that last verse that we just read. It says, now for a recompense of the same, I speak as unto my children. I mean, that's how dear these kids are to him. And when I say kids, they're like his family. You know, someone, he said he was the father of the faith. He's not talking about a priest. He's talking about somebody that brought them to salvation. Not that he'd give them salvation, but he brought them to Christ and they had come into the family of God. And that's how precious they were. Just like a, you know, a, a mother or a dad, how precious their children are to them. That's the same way these born-again converts were to him. He said, Be ye also enlarged, growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We could say, the next few verses here, when we talk about enlarged, we're not talking about worldly. We're talking about godly because look at the next verse. It says, Be ye not, what's that word? Unequally, Unequally yoked together. And it, it doesn't say anything about people's races or colors. It doesn't talk about how much money somebody has or anything else. It talks about unbelievers. You know, I've, I've talked to people before getting married and stuff a lot of times, and, and when I talk to them, you know, one of the things I break, bring up, do you all have a relationship with Christ? Do you both have a relationship the same way with the Lord? And, and again, you know, that makes a difference. And again, this isn't just about marriage. This is about fellowship. This is about being strengthened with other people. Uh, again, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more as we go. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 
For what fellowship, the word Coin O'Neill, we take that, you know, Kathy Cash named our youth group, Coin O'Neill Youth, many years ago. And Coin O'Neill means you are a fellowship. And she used it for our youth group because that's what they were doing was fellowshipping. But they were fellowshipping in Christ. They weren't fellowshipping with the worldly things or, you know, the things that don't amount to anything except grief and hurt and heartaches. But it says, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? If you've ever dealt with somebody that's had a drug addiction, and I didn't, I don't even want to ask for hands to go up. I guarantee, I guarantee you, all of us have had somebody that we've known or somebody in our family. You know, the first thing that I find out that somebody that's got a drug addiction, if you ever want to get them cleared up you got to get them away from their old friends. Their friends will kill them. Alcoholics will do the same, but I believe drug, drugs are worse because it's such a dependent thing inside of the chemistry of the body. Uh, you know, they're already fighting for it, but then they've got other people that are fighting on top of it with them. You know, I, I had somebody who was very dear to me, and I know the first thing that you had to do is get their phone and throw it in the dump because their telephone would just be ringing over and over again with somebody trying to get into that same stuff. You know, if Christians were that dogmatic as, as the drug dealers are, because, you know, they're dealing with a chemistry in the body, they're dealing with, a, you know, an ungodly thing that's destroying them, but we're dealing with something that's touching people's lives, something that's ministering to help grow and, and again, help us to be closer. So, again, like I say, if you want to have fellowship with somebody, you're going to have to find people. That's why we come to church, folks. It's not because it's just a good thing to do. It's not just the right thing to do. And I know we had better fellowship before COVID-19. I understand that. We could get closer. We didn't have to wear a mask. We could not have to worry about the six-foot distance and all that stuff. And by the way, we still are dealing with that. You all know that. And people watch it. But at the same time, that was a closeness. But we could still come together even though we can't physically get as close as we did before or shouldn't have. But at the same time, you know, that fellowship is with people that trust in God. That fellowship is with people that are going to encourage you, not discourage you. People that are going to help lift you up in the things of the kingdom and not tear you down. Have you ever been around people that will just tear you to pieces? That will just bring you down to the dumps? And I mean, they'll just find every fault that they can in you even sometimes. And it's like you just can't wait to just be around them over and over again, can you? <laughs> you know better than that. You just can't wait. You, you care about them, but you don't want to just keep talking about all your faults and all your hurts and all your pain. Somewhere along the line, I need something to lift me up. Somewhere along the line, I need to know how Christ can help me. But anyway, again, that's the kind of fellowship we're trying to bring across here. Verse 15 says, And what concord or harmony even hath Christ with Belial, talking about Satan as Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? When we're talking about an infidel, we're talking about an unbeliever. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You know, a, a lot of people have trouble with, I, I'm not saying Christians, but people that are not of the Christian faith. They think that we're, a, you know, a, a narrow-minded bunch of, you know, stiff necks, this, that, and the other. And hopefully... Some people get that out of their head, but it's basically because we've got one view. And I gotta tell you, we can't afford to have another one because you know the Bible says wide and broad is the way that leads to destruction, but straight and narrow is the way that leadeth into, into righteousness or into eternal life. And Jesus Christ tells us in John 14, 6. I remember Brother Buck No, he'd go around teaching and preaching that everywhere. And again, I, I even wrote his name in one of my Bibles one time because he was a guy, I remember that used to hand the Bible tracts out in the hospitals and stuff. And there was other people that did that. But I know when I was a little boy, when I go to the hospital, but I thought that was the neatest thing. You know how kids always want to stick their finger in a telephone? You know, the telephone booth that had the little thing with a change you come out of? You know, all of us know what those are, but if you go out here and talk to somebody that's about 20 years younger than I am, they don't have a clue what we're talking about. <laughs> What is a telephone booth? What is that? What are you talking about? But I know, again, I'm pretty sure Buck was the one that did it. When you couldn't find no change in her, Buck would slip one of the little Bibles in there. 
And I remember, you know, when you'd be in one of the hospitals or something where you had the waiting rooms and they had the table, he'd put them little Bibles out there and you'd find them little Bible tracts and read about it. Always, every one of them would have a plan of salvation and they would always stand upon John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. It's not by Buddha, it's not by Krishna, it's not by religion, it's not by some man or some woman. It's about Christ and Christ alone. So, you know, we are pretty narrow when it comes to that. And it's not because, you know, that we're hateful or mean. It's just the fact I know the truth. I don't want to believe ten other lies. I want to know what the truth is and forget all the other stuff. But Jesus is again. But again... Because look at what we say when we come into verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, or even the unfit thing, and I will receive... You know what an unclean thing is? Anything of unbelief. And unbelief is not in the beliefs of the things of this world. Unbelief is anything that would take you away from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Take you away from believing that Jesus died for our sins. Take you away from believing that He was buried and rose again. And because He lives, and we'll accept Him through repentance unto salvation, we'll live throughout eternity also. But it says, And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Aren't you glad that you're loved by God? Aren't you glad that you're considered a son or a daughter of God? You know, the Bible says when your mother and your father on this earth forsake you, the Lord will lift you up. You know, even people that have had mothers and fathers that didn't care for, God still did. God always will. You know, we're seeing more of that today than we did years ago because of all the ungodliness going on in the world right now. But at the same time, you know, years ago you would have never thought about, you know, a mother and a father not caring about their children. They might not care about each other, but they still care about their children. Unfortunately, I can't say that about everybody today. But, you know, that's why the Scripture tells us, you know, if they forsake you, the Lord will lift you up. Let's go on into chapter 7, just a verse or two. Matter of fact, I just want to read one verse and then I want to go back to Galatians for a little bit. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. How can I cleanse myself? Take a bath? Get baptized? No. I've got to go to the things of God, not to myself. Because I can't fix myself. But it says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and what? In the fear of God. You know, people have almost thrown the fear of God away today. You know, they're, you know, people run around with these shirts that says no fear and all these different things. Well, well i got to tell you folks, you know, when, when I was a little kid, I learned that if you touch fire, you get burned. <laughs> you know, if you put your hand on a hot stove, it hurts. You know, if you jump off too high of a, of a building, and I'm talking about off a roof or something, you can break your leg. You know, there's some dumb things that you can do, and there's some fear in that. You know, people say that we're not to have any fear at all. Well, there is some fear that you need to have when it comes to reverence and respect, and especially with God. I want us to turn, and I want you to hold your place. We'll come back to this. But if you will tonight, turn over to Galatians, some familiar verses once again. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 tonight. Five thirteen. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. What is liberty? Freedom. I'm free. You know, Brother Cash used to say, you know, I'm free to do anything I want to. I'm free to go anywhere I want to. I'm free to say anything I want to say. But you know what? He made the statement that I want to make too. The things that I used to want to do, the places I used to want to go, the play, the way that I want to behave, it's not the same. So I do have the freedom, but it's not the freedom of the flesh. It's the freedom of God's Spirit working inside of me. I don't want to do the things I used to do. I don't want to go the places I used to go. I don't want to be the way I used to be. And again, whether you was the worst of the worst or whether you was just a, you know, a little goody two-shoe or whatever, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know what I'm saying, you know, the best of the best is still bad when it comes to Christianity because you can't get saved by being just a good person. Just being a good person will get you straight to hell. 
You say, Neil, and I thought that's what we're striving for. You're striving to be good by God, not by you. My goodness is as filthy rags in the sight of God, Isaiah 64 says. But His righteousness, that's what really counts. Because he, you know, I, I like, the, again, them little marquees that they put out of the church. You know, you catch them and God will clean them. <laughs> you know, sometimes we like to clean people up, straighten them out, make them behave and put chains around them and make them behave. You know, we preached about the chains the other day. You know, you can't make people behave as much as you want to. You know, if you got children, of course you're going to correct them as, as a mother and a father growing up. But as sooner or later you give up on that too, don't you? Or basically you have to. Then you just got to keep picking them up every time they fall down, unfortunately. But aren't you glad God picks us up every time we fall down, too? I'm sure all of us has fell down a few times in our life, you know, regardless of how bad or how, you know, terrible we may think it is. All of us has had our falls in our life. But anyway, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by. There's that four-letter word, by love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Shirley, I think you brought this when we was asking a question last week. Thou shall do what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. I know Mary Shepherd used to point that verse out to me. She said, remember, you do got to care about yourself too. Just be careful you don't do too much of it. <laughs> if you're going to care about others, you've got to care about yourself too. You can't, in other words, you can't just get run over all the time with what you're trying to tell me. But anyway, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But verse 15 says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed, beware that ye be not consumed or destroyed one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. You know, we're talking about perfecting holiness and righteousness here. It says, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you're having a bad thought, when you're having a stressful thought about somebody else or something, have you ever tried praying for them? It's hard to stay mad for, at somebody when you're praying for them. I'm talking about really praying. I'm not talking about now laying me down to sleep for the moment. I'm talking about, and again, I'm not saying that is a prayer. I prayed it, and some of you all have too. But I'm talking about just praying out of, of just going through the motions. I'm talking about literally praying for somebody. When you're praying for somebody that's upset you, it's hard to stay upset with them. I'm not saying you're not going to be having some fits and you're going to have some reserves about people. But, you know, if you're having some anger issues, if you're having some unforgiveness issues, if you'll just begin to pray for that person and pray for them that God will not only give you the ability to get them out of your mind, but at the same time give you the ability to forgive them or forget whatever they've done to you. But again, that's a whole other topic there. It says, go on here. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you're trying to live in the flesh all the time, you're not going to be able to do what God's wanting you to do. That's why it's so important to stay in God's Word. That's important to stay in prayer. It's important to stay in fellowship with people that love God. You know, when we were talking about that coin O'Neill fellowship there earlier, like I say, when you, you know, if you're a drunk, you're going to want to hang out with drunks. If you're a dope addict, you're going to want to hang out with dope addicts. If you're a Christian, I hope you want to hang out with Christians. And again, even in that sense, you want to hang out with people that's going to build up and not tear down. I'm not saying you don't ever stand for truth. You, there's some things you've got to speak out in love sometimes. And I like the way Brother Cash used to, but uh, you know, tell the truth, but make sure you do it in love. Don't, you know, if you're trying to tell somebody something that they need to straighten out, don't do it with a hateful spirit. Don't do it with, you know, come to them and say, you know, you're just a piece of trash. You're not going to, no, do it in a sense, I care about you. I love you. And I, I care enough to tell you the truth that you can't keep doing this and living for God. It's not going to work. You're going to be torn apart. You're going to be, you know, you can't straddle the fence. If you're on one side and on the other side, you're miserable in church and out of church. You need to get in that one focus. Just jump on over the cross the fence and get on the good side, so to speak. But anyway, that, that's the fight that we have. But it says, these are contrary 
in opposition, we could say, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. You know, the law, again, we talked about that time and time again, all those different laws. They wasn't so you could learn how to do right from wrong. They were so you could learn that you couldn't do it without God. It was so you could learn that, you know, if you give me 613 laws, I'm probably going to break 520 of them right off the bat. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm talking about in the flesh. The only way I'm going to be able to follow any of those is through God's grace, through God's mercy, through God directing me. You know, you know, we narrowed it down a while ago. You know, love thy neighbors as self. And again, Shirley, you mentioned the other one. Love the Lord our God with all the heart, soul, mind, and body also. But it says, but if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, God's control of my life instead of me trying to follow a list that I can't do on my own strength. That doesn't mean the law was bad. You know, the law and even the commandments, those were right. But the fact is, is we can't do right without God's Spirit. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our life. That's why we need God's Holy Ghost power to help us to endure the things that we need to. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, in other words, sexual perversions, whatever they might be, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, and that can be sensuality. It says, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variances, and that can be discord of emulations or jealousies, rash, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness. You know, I've given you a list here tonight. <laughs> Revealings and such like of which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall what not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me ask you something. Have any of us been guilty of any of them here? You don't have to raise your hand. We've all probably been guilty in one, two, or half a dozen or a bunch of them that we just listed there. But that's why we've got to get on the other side. That's why we've got to get born again. That's why we need God's grace and mercy to give us directions and guidance. Because if we're still walking in the flesh, those are the things that we're always going to end up striving to do, whether we like to or not. Because the flesh likes to. Whether your spirit likes to or not, your flesh is going to want to do those ungodly things. You can't help it. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. But verse 22 here, these are, and there's nine of these that are listed here. But the fruit of the Spirit, and notice what the first one is, love. And that's talking about God's love. That's talking about that agape love. That's not the love that lusts. That's not the love that has friendship. That's the love that says, I'm going to love you if you hate my guts. I'm going to love you if you spit in my face. I may not want to run around with you, but I'm still going to love you. But at the same time, it's a love that goes unconditional, I guess is what we're looking for. It says love, joy. And again, joy is not a sin, folks. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, temperance. How's your temper today? We all need a little bit of that. Again, such there is no law. There's nine different things mentioned there. Notice when it says, by the fruit of the Spirit, not fruits. All of them work together. They're not just nine different individualities. All of them are a part of the same. You can't just have one of them and say it's good enough. I need all nine of them working in my life. And again, it's not by your own power, your own strength. You'll never get nowhere that way. It's got to be God working in us through His hope and glory. But it says, And they that are Christ have did what? Crucified the flesh. That means I've put it to death. You know, I even showed that. You even showed that. If you've, you know, you've been saved and when you were baptized, why do we get baptized in water? And again, I don't know, you know, we can argue about does water baptism save you? I don't believe so. I believe it's something you ought to do if you can. But at the same time, what does water baptism actually do? It shows what we've already did inside. It's a token of a covenant that we've made with God. When you show that old person, and I'm saying old, I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about the old person that used to live, the person that lived in sin. When you show that person going underwater, you're showing that you're crucifying that person. You're showing that that person's died. They're buried in baptism. And when they're raised, guess what? They're raised in the power and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what you're showing other people unashamedly. 
You do that by accepting Christ, of course, also. But at the same time, that's why we are baptized, to show forth that, that we're unashamed with that. And it says, go on here, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affliction, affections or the passions and lust. If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. You know, Paul kind of showed that with his ministry. He wasn't seeking glory for himself or any of them other people that are part of the ministry, especially we're talking about apostles back there. Provoking one another and envying one another. We're not looking for that. I want you to turn back with me, if you will, back where we were at in 2 Corinthians, just a few pages back probably in your Bible. But going back into that 7th chapter where we left off, and I will read that verse again now that we've read through Galatians. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. And again, we cleanse ourselves by being led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. From all filthiness of the flesh and Spirit, perfecting holiness. Are you ever going to be perfect? You know, the Bible says, Be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is. That word perfect means mature. It doesn't mean sinless perfection because there's not a man or woman on this earth that's ever going to actually come to the point of sinless perfection. Because not only do you sin with omissions, but commission. You know, there's sins that you do by doing things wrong, but there's sins sometimes that you do that simply you didn't do what you're supposed to. God may have laid something on your heart to do and you just fought with it and didn't do it. I don't know what those are and you don't know what mine are. You know, only God knows that. So you're dealing with all of that. But you know, when we're talking about perfecting holiness, growing up, you know, becoming mature and getting closer to God, you know, one of the, the desires I have in my life is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter talks about that. Going on here into this chapter here, it says, Receive us, we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. In other words, we're not cheating, lying, or stealing to anybody. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulations. He's happy because he knows that he's going to heaven. He's, he's, he's joyful because he knows that his life is hid in Christ, regardless of all the other hurts and pains. For when we were come unto Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, one of the other apostles, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation or even a prize wherewith he was comforting you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me. Wow, caring so much. So that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry, and he's pointing back at the 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when there was a man in their, in their fellowship that was actually committing adultery, and they were rejoicing. You know why they were rejoicing? Because we can get away. Come to our church. You can do anything you want to. Glory to God. This is the place to be. I mean, we do it all here. Just join this church. That's why. He said, you know, instead of you all rejoicing and boasting, you ought to be mourning. You ought to be crying. Because that soul, you need to turn that soul over to Satan. Why? Not for the destruction of his soul, but for the destruction of the flesh that he could get his, get his life back right with Christ. Does churches believe you can do anything, get away with anything nowadays? I'll let you all look around a little bit. I think there's a few out there you might want to be concerned about. Uh, don't believe every little pot of gold that comes along because you can't live wrong and die right, folks. You can't live like hell and go to heaven. But you can't live without God and ever live right anyway. That's why it takes God and that's what I'm trying to point out either way. But in, in 1 Corinthians, he, he had wrote a letter and he was trying to make them sorrowful about what they were doing and told them to put that guy out of the fellowship. I mean, they were excommunicating him, I guess is what they would call it that day and age, and, and not to just hate him and to put him out. And he said, don't, don't despise him, but just let him know that he can't be a part of your fellowship. Your you know, when we're talking about fellowship, the place where you get strength from one another. 
And again, I don't think that they would let him not come to the church building. It was the fact, or synagogue, whatever they had back then. It was the fact that they wouldn't let him be a part of their communion, their fellowship. You know, even in taking communion, you ought to watch with that. I'm not saying watch somebody else, watch yourself on that. But at the same time, you know, that, that fellowship that they had, they would put him out of that until he got right with God, and then he would get to come back into it. But reading on here, it says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle or the same letter hath made you sorry, though it, would, though it were but for a season. I uh, preached at the Clark County Jail years ago, and the lady... I can't remember her last name now, but uh, when I went there to preach, the lady told me, she said, uh, now I know these are all people that are in jail, you know, and she said, I know what people say about jailhouse religion. And she said, but if you go in there and you preach and you don't make an altar call when you're finished, I'll never have you back here again. I don't want you back. If you can't, if you can't offer them salvation, you're just wasting our time. And I did that. I did what I was going to do it anyway, but I mean, she told me flat up, and she said, what a lot of people do is believe that because of jailhouse religion, you do, you know, they're all, and when I did have an altar call, you couldn't call them up because they're in jail, you know, you can't bring them up against it, you talk about social distance, they definitely had it there, but at the same time, when you, all you can do is ask them to stand, and guess how many stood? Every last one of them. So, you know, in your mind, you're thinking, well, how many is real? Well, the lady had this thought, you know, if just one of them is real, that's all that really matters. You know, if two of them, you know, I'm not the judge, you're not the judge, just because, and you know, you don't know their circumstances, you don't know what they're going through. You know, if they stand up out of just emotions or whatever, that's none of my business because all of us has got emotions. All of us have got hurts and pains. But if that person don't have that chance, you're wrecking them. You're, you're destroying them. Give them that chance. You know, since we've been doing the webcast on Sunday morning, I've been trying to make sure that we have a, you know, a prayer of repentance every Sunday. I'm not just trying to do that out of repetition. I'm doing that because of somebody that's not normally watching or somebody that won't normally go to church. That is one good thing that we do have. There's people that won't set foot in a church building, but they'll watch something if you, if you ask them. I might not be able to ask them, but you might be able to ask them. And if they like it, they might tune in a couple of times. Something on there, something, some song, some ministry, some something the preacher says, something, you know, whether it's ours or somebody else's, something might touch their lives. And even though they won't step into a church building, that'll get a hold of their life. So again, it's worth, you know, it'll be worth it after all the old song goes. But anyway, go on here so we can finish up. But it says. Now rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed through repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us and nothing. Worldly sorrow will make you cry, folks. You know, on the other hand, uh, me talking about the jailhouse repentance, I have seen people, you know, that have come to an altar, and again, we used to have bigger altar calls. It's not the same way, unfortunately, today. But people would come... Uh, they lost their girlfriend, they lost their wife, they lost their job, they lost their money. And you're hoping with all your heart that they're going to be right when they do this. And, and again, they get the girlfriend back, they get the wife back, they get the dog back, they get, well, I'm not going to talk about country music tonight, but, but, uh, but going on, they get everything, that whatever they lost back. And then all of a sudden, you don't see them no more. That goes back to that jailhouse repentance. That's not for me to judge. I still, you know, they get something sold in their heart. You don't know somewhere along the line that's still going to be pulled on them. You know, I've been in church all my life, and I know that there was things that I did wrong for 27 years that I didn't give a flop about, but there was always a consciousness in me. I always remember, you know, I, well, I better not. Well, anyway, I, I remember going to one of the bars here in town that used to be the church, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And as I said, when I went down there with one of my relatives and we were going to sit there and drink and shoot pool, I had to leave. My conscience wouldn't let me do that. I'm sitting there thinking, that's where my grandma used to teach the, the Bible to me. And it's like, I can't handle this, and I had to get up and leave. That's the kind of consciousness I'm talking about. Even though I hadn't been saved yet, there was still something planted in me. There's something planted in all of us. That's why we're here tonight. Something was in our hearts somewhere along the line, and it brought forth the maturity somewhere along the line. But reading on here, it says, 
For behold, this, this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, the one that he was trying to correct back here in 1 Corinthians, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. In other words, let you know that I love you, that I care about you. I, I care enough to tell you the truth. You ever heard of tough love? We all have trouble with that, don't we? But again, to tell somebody the truth, whether you make them do it or not, you can't do that. But again, to stand for that. It, it says, for our care for you and the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore, we are comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joy we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. I'm so glad that you're saved. I'm so glad that you're living right for God. I'm so glad that even though you may have faults and you may have some falls and you might have to get picked back up, you're still doing your best to serve God. You're still seeking God with all your heart the best you know how. Any thoughts or any Thing you want to put into that tonight? Again, I know we read through a lot of that quickly. And especially some of those things with all the different things that they did, but just getting through the two chapters. But again, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, I think that would be probably the key word that I would probably want to focus on tonight. Because, you know, without holiness, the Bible said, no man shall see God. And that's the sad thing about it is we've almost threw holiness out of the, sometimes out of the church today. It's like, you know, it don't matter how you live, it does, folks. But it's got to be God living in you to make you want to do that because you can't do it on your own. Remember that song, I thought I could do it all on my own, but I found out I can't even walk. <laughs> I love that song, without even holding my hands. But anyway... Anybody got any comments? Anything you want to share tonight? Give us a testimony tonight, Mike. God doing you good? I know it's been like February was eight years since my widow made her heart attack. It's uh, two strokes, cancer. I'm still here, man. <laughs> Amen. God is good. God is good. Amen. Anybody else tonight? Mary? Again, like I said, we certainly want to remember the Jones family, the other families that have had loved ones to pass away. Uh, again, Lisa Zybert's son, uh, Mark Doolin, Dolan or Doolin, I hope I'm pronouncing that right one way or another. But uh, praying for him that had a, a mini stroke. He did have a mini stroke, but not for sure how severe that was. I think he was getting his speech back the other day pretty good, so it sounded like everything was going well with that. Uh, still praying for Kenny Corden. He is back home. Uh, still praying for David Perkins who's taken rehab. Lisa Davis, uh, Serena was telling me she was with her tonight, but she's still not been feeling well. She's got one more round of that chemo. And uh, pray to God that it won't be as hurtful and harmful as it has been the other, how many ever times she's suffered. Because this took her down farther every time. Uh, still praying for her brother Kevin and also for her dad, Dave, uh, her dad Donald. Uh, both of them's had some heart issues, and I think uh, the brothers, he's had some blood pressure too. Still praying for the Bodkins, uh, Eddie and Violet, and uh, also for the Adkins, praying for Doris and Ben, 
And for Doris, as she's telling us that she's going to be having this procedure done on the 30th, excuse me, certainly want to keep her in prayer. I'm still praying for Steve Doss. That's Mike and Michelle's brother. Uh, from what I understand, still taking rehab. Uh, we have some unspoken prayer requests. And uh, also a lady had called and asked me to pray for her. Uh, one of her relatives was Cyril Palsy, however you pronounce that. The name was Alexander, and then there was another seven-year-old, Exiavar, was the other one that asked prayer for also. But uh, certainly want to keep these in prayer. Also for my wife with that crucial headache that she was having, and then for all others. Taking prayer requests from you all tonight, Buddy, Ernie? Family, not spoken. Okay. Ben? For Dorsey. Okay. Anybody else prayer requests tonight? Sherry? For my neighbor, Linda Jackson, who's going to have open heart surgery on March 9th. The 9th, isn't it? Okay. Linda was her name, right? Yes. Okay. Doris? For my youngest son, Eric, he hasn't been feeling good. He had to go to the doctor today. Okay. Absolutely. Anybody else prayer requests? Mike? Uh, Bethany and Travis went on a road trip. Okay. Pray for those angels that camp about. Anybody else? Okay. How many with uplifted hands for yourself or someone else? God sees those hands. If you want, you can stand. If you want, you can sit. But let's agree in prayer tonight. We still have our prayer book of remembrance up here in the front. Anytime you want to put something on that, you're more than welcome to do so. We're going to agree in prayer tonight and close out. But Father God, we thank you tonight, Lord, that you are our God, that you're our Lord and our Savior. We thank you that Jesus Christ did die for our sins. We thank you that he was buried and rose again. And because he lives, we can live also. We thank you for that resurrection power that brings us into eternal life through you. I thank you, God, for those that are gathered in this building tonight. I thank you for those that will gather watching again the webcast. I pray you're touching upon each and every one of them. Uh, whether it be many or whether it be few, touch and minister to every life. Uh, we do pray for the families that have had loved ones to pass away, Lord, that you'll touch and minister to their needs, uh, the Joneses and others. We just lift them up to you in prayer. Pray for the ladies also that uh, had a, a brother buried this week too. We continue to pray for Kenny Carden. Thank you that he got to go home. Uh, praying that Richard True is doing well too from that heart surgery he had the other day. Uh, still lifting up Lisa Davis and her, her dad and her brother also. Uh, all the others that have been mentioned, the Bodkins, for, uh, the Adkins also, and especially for Doris with this shoulder surgery that she's going to be having. Still praying for those that are in rehabs and nursing homes, uh, for those that are dealing with chemo and different treatments. We do pray for, as Sherry mentioned, Linda Jackson with that heart surgery coming up on the 9th. We pray that everything will go well with that. Uh, again, for Lisa Zybert's uh, son, uh, again, Mark Dolan, we pray for him tonight. Pray that if he's not out of the hospital, that he shortly will be. And again, for the two men that uh, the lady asked prayer for the other day, the Alexander and the Aviar, for prayer also. Pray for the ones that have been mentioned by the people here tonight, for the hands that went up, for those that will be watching and listening by web, for their needs as well, for our prayer book of remembrance up here, uh, the names that are listed in there, for the families that are still surviving. And we just lift each and every one of them up to you in prayer. We pray for our country, for its leaders, and we pray for this land to truly turn back to you where we can truly be a nation under God with the liberty of Jesus Christ. Again, for our military, police departments, fire departments, medical department, EMSs, and farmers, for all those that protect and serve us, we pray that you'll protect them. Again, be with us as we go to our homes tonight. Pray for my wife with that headache to be gone in Jesus' name. And uh, again, we just lift these up to you in prayer. And again, for Kenny Corden, I pray that he'll be continuing to do better all the time too. Be with us all. Give us a safe journey to our homes or wherever we go at this evening. And for those needs that are uh, being asked for by the people in the web that are watching by webcast, touch and minister to them too. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come back and be with us Sunday if you can. Have a good evening. Love all of you. God does too. God bless.